So May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I have with me Rola El Blue. She, she's a child and adolescent therapist at Al Haroub Medical Center. Uh, today we're going to discuss a bunch of different topics about mental health. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I'd like you to introduce yourself, please. Okay, so my name is Rulal Belushi. Like you said, I'm a child and adolescent therapist at Al Harub uh, Medical Clinic. I finished my bachelor's in psychology, mm-hmm. bachelor's of science in Cardiff University in 2019. I graduated. And then obviously COVID happened right after. So I took a little bit of a break, did a bit of research in between. And then I went and I pursued my master's in clinical mm-hmm. psychology in Reading University. Okay. Yeah. So can you tell me, so now you are currently working as a child and adolescent therapist. Can you tell me a bit about what you do on a day-to-day basis? Okay. So a lot of my work involves working with clients. Mm -hmm. So generally, you know, we'll book an appointment with a client. We'll see them. Uh, First session is mainly like an introductory session, trying to get some background info. And then um, the rest of the sessions Basically, it's me working with the client to treat their difficulties, work with what they're struggling with, and just getting to know where they struggle with in life. Okay. And what are the most common mental health issues you've seen here in Oman? So because I work mainly with young adults and Mm -hmm. teenagers, so you see a lot of, you know, anxiety related difficulties and struggles you see a lot of low mood depression um, low energy there's also a lot of you notice a lot of like social anxiety and I think this is especially after COVID-19 so I think with all that isolation and that you know social distancing a lot a lot of people um, maybe find it difficult to get back out and you know socialize again and feel comfortable doing that especially after being scared off from doing that you know completely okay for what almost two years but yeah okay mm-hmm. how do you get them out of that so is it, first of all it's it's actually a diagnosed mental health illness uh, what low is? energy because you mentioned low energy uh, no who it's a symptom of okay. depression So usually when we diagnose depression, we Mm -hmm. look at a few symptoms. Obviously, these symptoms include, you know, low energy, um, always fatigued, um, no motivation, um, loss of, you know, um, pleasure and activities they used to enjoy. Uh, You notice that, you know, their their eating patterns start changing, their um, sleeping patterns are different. Mm -hmm. So these are the main symptoms you see in people with depression. Um, But yeah, it's low energy is a symptom of depression depression is the diagnosis okay is there obviously there's differences in severity so Mm -hmm. some people can come maybe with a lower severity of depression some people can come with a higher so i would assume the higher would have to get help yes but for someone maybe who's struggling with lower levels of depression Mm -hmm. what are some things they can do at home so okay let's first go over the fact that how do people know when Mm -hmm. they're struggling how do people first identify that they're not okay so you know people notice that their mental health is basically declining when they notice differences in their moods differences in like i said how they enjoy the activities they used to enjoy so it doesn't get to a point where they need to see someone professional until it starts impacting their quality of life so up to that point you know they can engage in things that make them happy and that's different for every person right so some people might find um that they enjoy you know going out for walks being Mm -hmm. outdoors engaging in physical activities Um, Some like to engage in their hobbies, some like to spend some time with family, some like to socialize, some can, you know, do self-care, take care of themselves, even if it's just, you know, painting their nails a certain color that they haven't painted in a long time, or even buying themselves new earrings. So little things to make themselves happy. Exactly. And, And like I said, that's different for everybody. So for me, I might enjoy, you know, a walk on the beach during sunset. Someone else might find, okay, watching a movie on Netflix is something they enjoy. You know, but these are little things they can do to feel better. Okay. For something like depression or anxiety. Yeah. Do you feel people come to you themselves or are they usually brought in by someone else? Um, So a lot of the times you'll see their parents bringing them in. You know, they notice that their child is not um, engaging as well as much as they used to. They're not as um, happy, not as uh, funny or friendly. Um, 
so sometimes you'll see yes the parents are bringing them in but a lot of the times you actually see that you know they people themselves, themselves are able to identify that they're not okay okay and there's that comfort in seeking help and that acceptance mm-hmm. you know in helping yourself whether it's you know, mentally which is something that you don't you any you know, it's not very common you know but okay. now it's becoming more and more common and it's really nice to see that awareness in the young adults young children you know they're able to verbalize that they are not okay that I need to see somebody okay I need to you know talk to somebody and, and they're quite open to getting help as opposed to maybe before yeah yes very very open which is very nice to see and that's the thing also yeah, I mean, with therapy mm-hmm. you need to make sure that the person wants to be better wants to seek help want you okay. they have that intention you know otherwise there's not much we can do from our yeah, side yeah I had that question in mm-hmm. my mind mm-hmm. so for example what happens when someone comes to you and you can clearly tell they have mental health issues mm-hmm. Okay, so what happens yeah. if someone comes to you and you can clearly tell they have mental health issues, but they're not willing to get the help? For example, mm. let's say if you put them on medication, they're not willing to get the medication. Yeah. If you put them, for example, you have sessions, methylene, um, I don't know, psychotherapy sessions or something, mm. they will not attend. Mm-mm. How do you deal with that? There's not much you can do from your end? Yes. So because I work at a private clinic, okay. it's mostly they decide that they want to come see somebody. Okay. okay. A lot of the times, yes, people will come in, you know, they'll say they want to speak to somebody, but they have that idea that therapy is just them talking and, you know, letting it out and venting, which sometimes, yes, that is the case. You know, if they need to vent and they need to release some of the stuff that they're facing or mm-hmm. like share their emotions, share their thoughts. Um, but then a lot of the times they don't realize that therapy only works if they have that intention to work on themselves. Okay. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's something that a lot of people have you know, that struggle with to understand that this is a journey this is you know this is going to require a lot of effort like a, a lot journey of, of healing and everything and you have to put in that effort to want to change exactly and okay. with people that are a bit resistant to therapy you try to psychoeducate them you know you let them know so i noticed this in you i noticed that you know you avoid these kind of feelings you avoid these kind of conversations okay. you avoid this and that um i notice you engage in these kind of behaviors which okay. may not be very helpful so you make you. them aware of what they're doing that they might not be noticing basically okay. basically because that's how it all starts right mm-hmm. you got to be aware of what you're facing what you're struggling with how it affects you and a lot of the times yes they'll say you know i feel this this is but they don't see how it affects their day-to-day lives they don't see how it affects their um relationships how it affects how they you know talk to people mm-hmm. how they manage themselves so part of the first few sessions is that educating them making them aware um helping them realize realize that you know this is going to be a lot of our work together me trying to understand where did it go wrong what mm-hmm. happens that is helping you or not helping you and it's just bringing them into that sense of like awareness consciousness and everything basically okay some symptoms like you mentioned are very easy to diagnose like obviously yeah. you can tell when you have low energy you can tell for example if you used to laugh a lot and mm. you know suddenly you're not mm. but i've seen this a lot on social media there was even that comedian who I don't know if this is too like uh, dark to That's bring okay. up, but you know he he committed suicide. Mm-hmm. Robin something, mm-hmm. uh, I forgot his name. Is you it can, the comedian who um, was on that Jelly Flubber thingy that movie? Is it Jelly Flubber? Know. Wait, wait, isn't it cheaper by the dozen? Yeah, that guy. I think that guy. No, it's I, I guy. assume everyone knows who we're talking yeah, about, so we'll so. stop there. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was a comedian. He was making people laugh. He was going out yeah. smiling every day. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they call it, but I think it also applies to anxiety. Some people are very very anxious. I think. They, they come out, mask it. they yeah. can mask it. This is called high functioning anxiety, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Many people might not know mm-hmm. that these people, for example, are suffering from depression or anxiety. Yeah. But the person, him or herself, can also not know because they'll be like, okay, this is not technically affecting my daily life. Mm-hmm. I'm still going to work. I'm still mm-hmm. laughing, making jokes. I'm still doing all of that. Mm-hmm. How How can they be aware that they have an issue? when they're still maintaining a daily because for some people it is quite dark what they go through when they're alone so. you know but when you're still functioning quite well in society mm-hmm. how do you see that in yourself enough to go and get help mm-hmm. like what do you look for 
So this is really difficult because, like you said, Jenny, sometimes people are very good at masking it. Sometimes they don't even realize that things are changing for them. You know, they don't have that sense of awareness that, okay, actually, I'm not okay. Things don't feel as right as they used to be. But that's why it's important to have like a support system, you know, to have people basically around you, be there for you. And then they maybe if you don't notice it in yourself, they can notice it, you know, and they can tell you like, you know, I notice maybe you're not sleeping as well. Maybe, you know, you haven't finished your food. This isn't you. Maybe you know. you're irritable. Yeah, maybe you're irritable, but I think it's important to be around people. So if you can't pick it up on yourself, people can at least notice it in you. But then again, people are, can be really good at masking it. And okay. It's very difficult to, you know, pick on someone like, oh, you don't seem okay. Like as if we're trying to force them to not feel okay, you know, when they are convinced that they're fine. And they're functioning quite normally in, exactly. in everyday life. Exactly. But yeah, and usually that's what we pay attention to. Is it impacting your quality of life? Is it impacting your day-to-day -day functions? Is it impacting your basic needs like sleep, food, you know, okay. physical activity, those kind of things? And that's what people can maybe try to, you know, assess or be aware of or notice. You okay. know, are there any changes in these kind of basic needs that might be, you know, not very healthy for you and impacting you basically. Okay. Yeah. And that's how they can see, for example, I may be functioning well in society, but these basic needs have yeah. been affected. There's probably something if I look deeper exactly. that I might need help in. Exactly. And only you know how well you sleep. Only you know okay. how much you eat, you know. Mm -hmm. not These things maybe aren't any stuff that people can notice, but maybe if you can, you know, take a look at these things within yourself or even notice in yourself, do I enjoy these things as much as I used to? Like, yes, you can pretend, you can put a face on, you can smile, you can laugh, but... Mm -hmm in inside are you are you really enjoying it okay. is this something that you want to keep doing is this something that brings you satisfaction or is it just something you're on autopilot with and just going with the flow okay you know okay so we're on the topic of getting help when you need it mm -hmm. whether it's like clearly you need help or it's more hidden mm -hmm. but the issue is getting help yeah not only in our society in general mm -hmm. but mainly and specifically in our society, we've had an issue where there was a lot of stigma mm -hmm. uh, surrounding getting help. Yeah. Do you feel that we still have this issue here? Of course. Of and course. do you see it? Like, are there any cases, for example, where you've had people who are hesitant or resistant to getting help? Yes, unfortunately. And you do notice that a lot. And sometimes it's because, you know, they'll, they'll come in, they'll have their initial consultation. They'll okay. let you know, OK, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. And then you'll let them know, okay, maybe you might benefit from, you know, a few sessions with me. Maybe it's it would be important for us to go over certain things that we didn't get the chance to go over today. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that, like you said, there's that hesitation, there's that resistance that mm, actually, I don't know if I'll be able to because I need to pay for this and I don't pay for my stuff, for example. My dad does or my mom does. Okay. So I'll have to let them know. And then that's where you notice that, Okay, and I'll tell them, okay, can you let them know? And then, you know, always give us give us a call back. We'll, we'll be happy to schedule an appointment. And you'll notice they'll say, oh, I have to sit and talk to them and explain to them because, you know, my family don't really understand this or they're not very open to this. And, you know, you know, they you see it on okay. a day-to-day -day basis, basically. And it's sad because sometimes, you know, you feel like, wow, this person really needs some support and mm -hmm. I wish I could support them. But it's very difficult if they're financially dependent on their parents. Okay. And that's where they that's how they need to pay for these sessions, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's I think it's important how you phrase it to them, basically, and how you bring it up to your family, for example, who are very, you know, who find mental health very sim stigmatized and difficult to talk about. And sometimes it could be helpful to, you know, just let them know. You know. It's not necessarily that I'm crazy or I'm, you know, I'm hallucinating or any of that stuff. You know, I'm just, I'm struggling a little bit and mm -hmm. it would be helpful to see somebody just to help me, guide me through, you know, this difficult period. Okay. But it, it depends how you bring it up because I think a lot of people have the, you know, misconception that, oh, if you've got a mental illness, you're crazy you're, or something, you're, you're violent, you're abusive, mm -hmm. you're, you know, in, unpredictable, all these, you know, negative things okay um tied to the idea of mental illness um f i think it's important that you know we you don't freeze. just okay. we don't just educate the client but we also try to educate the parents and we let them know you know it's nothing to be ashamed of if you're struggling with this or that this is very normal we live in a very high-paced you know lifestyle mm -hmm. everything's moving quick we see a lot of things on social media things that affect us things that influence us things that you know make us feel bad or you know you see all these um uh, world 
crises on social media and it, it's bound to make you feel heavy okay you know and it's okay to feel these things and to feel like you need someone to support you through it you know whether it's this or a breakup or you know whatever it might be that you're struggling with and i think it's it's a conversation that needs to be brought up more regularly so more awareness we raise awareness for in yes, general exactly okay this seems to be like one of these things where like maybe our generation or the younger generation is more accepting mm-hmm. of things like that and the older generation might be hesitant mm-hmm. because I, I do think that there was way more stigma so. like at in that time like it is kind of dying down now we have more awareness about this mm-hmm. i've heard this mm-hmm. okay so i'm I, I would like to ask what would you say if someone was to say this so for example maybe the older generation would be like in my day i, I mean i ha- i got sad i got mm-hmm. through Uh, ended relationships I went through for example the death of a family member I went through all this and I got through it by myself Mm. why do you need a therapist now yeah what would we say to that so usually I'd like to you know bring it up in a way that my experience is not like your experience that's number one you know we live in a different stage we live in a different time Mm -hmm. everything's different now it's impossible to compare now to then okay right and a lot of things are changing every single day okay things that are in our control things that are not in our control and just the 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 difficulties we face these days are very Mm -hmm. different than what they used to face and it was you know maybe a simpler time back then you know when maybe also they didn't have that much awareness about how much these things affect them and how they feel you know and now we're in this new era where we feel our feelings we talk about our feelings we understand we you know there's a lot more awareness into mental health now which is why we notice okay actually this is affecting me this is affecting me this is not helping me this is perfect for me you know okay. uh, it's that kind of thing where we again try to educate them like my experience is not like your experience mm-hmm. you know back then things were different and everyone's different you know okay that's true yeah like i mm. i even you know i could struggle with something and i could have a friend that's struggling with the same exact thing and we're in the same generation mm-hmm. but you know maybe her experience is different than your experience exactly. and, and she your might reactions be handling, exactly okay. she might be handling it way better because maybe she's got the skills maybe she's got the support system mm-hmm. maybe she's got the mental you know ability to take care of herself you know and some people just struggle a little bit more with that and again, they might need help exactly okay can we do something? Mm-hmm. This might sound silly, Shweya, mm-hmm. but I, f- I do feel it might be useful. Okay. So can we do something where I'm going to be the difficult... Uh, okay, this might sound bad for me to call it like that, but the parent who is not understanding like that okay. my child needs help. Okay. Okay, and then you respond to me, like, for example, because you mentioned, you know, it's kind of how you speak to them. You might be able to convince them if you if you say the right things, if you speak in the right yeah. way, you, you raise awareness in them in the right way. So. But I'm going to be the difficult mm-hmm. parent and I'm... You're going to be the child telling me, I decided I would like to go to therapy. Can you please pay for it? Okay. Okay. So you open the conversation with me. Okay. And I'll hit you back with comebacks. So, um, okay. Are you, you're my mom. Okay. I'm your mom. Okay. Okay. I mean, I I don't think I would be your dad. No, I don't think so either. (laughs) Okay. So, you know, mama, I feel like these days, um, I don't feel very good. I feel off. Um, I don't understand what it is. And I've been, you know, seeing that therapy could be helpful for somebody like me you know what do you think about it are you are you willing to support me in that decision are you happy to pay for the you know sessions did you pray uh yes i did pray okay and i definitely feel better after praying but i still feel like there's something that's bothering me and i don't know how to talk about it to you okay and the only way you can get over this is if we pay a lot of money to a therapist yeah and i you know i know it's a lot of money but at the end of the day it's for me and it's my health and just as you know you'd take me to the hospital and pay for a treatment to i don't know do a surgery for my finger i feel like this is just as beneficial for me and important for me to take care of my health mentally okay so i used to go through mental health issues when i was younger Mm -hmm my one of my parents passed away Mm. um i've been through changes in life Mm. i may have even been abused or something Mm -hmm. but i get past it on my own Mm -hmm. so you're telling me these little life changes you can't handle yes i actually i handled them when i was your age yes and you're very strong mama you know but i don't have those skills and i feel like i need somebody to help me you know equip me with those skills that i can use to live a happy life live a more fulfilling life Okay. You don't uh, think that's dramatic? Um, 
you know, I don't think it's dramatic. My personal experiences, any, I, I like to validate myself and I like to, I don't like to call myself dramatic. I think at this age, mm-hmm. I'm handling it in the best way possible. But I, if I could use a bit of support, why not? But in our days, we didn't have that. I know, but that's in your days and now in our days. You're calling me old? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but, okay. but yeah, things are different now, Mama. And I know it's very difficult for you to understand, but... I, you know, I want to promise you that this money won't go to waste. And if anything, I want to be a better person. I want to, you know, live a better life. And if anything, this is only going to get me to feel better. So why are you so against that? Okay. Mm. Okay, my child. Are you convinced? Yeah, go go <laughs> ahead. I'll pay for it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, but, but one thing like that I noticed in your conversation, our fake conversation, mm-hmm. is when you approach you also have to approach diplomatically Mm -hmm. because you are explaining something to someone who doesn't see a need for this exactly you know so when you approach as method and maybe a younger person who Mm. is dependent financially on someone yeah be diplomatic Mm -hmm. as much as you can because we are talking about people who might be suffering and everything and i know for example when i'm not in a good place Mm. i'm very snappy Mm. i'm very like irritable i'm very I don't think I speak in the nicest mm. way, That's okay. but you have to be conscious of that when you're approaching someone who might need their mind changed about something. Exactly. Not to know. Yeah, I don't understand me. Exactly. I need therapy. Exactly. Yani, no, there is also a, an approach that you can go about yeah. convincing maybe your parents or, or so, you know, an older generation or even someone in your generation who doesn't mm. understand it. Exactly. And just being firm and assertive and respectful and polite and Yani, we don't want it to be like a fight or like a battle to go to therapy. We want okay. it to come from an understanding point of view. You know, especially in a lot of parents say, oh, until, you know, you guys have been seeing everything on TikTok, on, on Netflix, media. you know, on social media. Everyone does therapy now. It's a trend, you know. But it, no, it's just that, you know, we're becoming more aware of how we're struggling and how difficult the life's demands are becoming, you know. And that's something that nobody can deny. So, and and know? what you said, it's way more fast paced. Exactly. Like in our own, like, I mean, I'm assuming we're around the same age. Mm. So like me growing up and, and you growing up, we saw the difference, Yani. Mm. It's so fast paced. It wasn't like that when we were just a bit younger, Yanni. Exactly. So so there is a big difference. Very and it does big. mentally affect you in a way that maybe earlier I don't think it was this Tomlan. this I don't I don't know what the right word is, like this this intense. Yeah, intense. I mean, intense this, is the right word. Yes, this fast. Day to day has become intense. Ayo. Exactly. Very demanding and yeah, like a lot of things have changed that we need to be very aware of and just how they affect us every day. You know, maybe we're not very aware, and but it's like little things we even see on social media, little mm-hmm. things like, you know, we'll see this girl at this age doing this much. You know, she's popular. She's got this many books published. I don't know. And then you're there and you're like, hmm. you're comparing yourself. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's like we have access to people to compare ourselves to, mm-hmm. of course. And it's addictive. Like you can easily go like, well, just don't look. Exactly. But mm. no, so. because you also want to, you know, assess yourself and evaluate where am I compared to other people but sometimes it can be a good thing you know comparing yourself to people but then it's also a bad thing because it's like you feel like oops I didn't get that far but also oh look what she's doing I can do the same Mm -hmm. so it's either this or that you know but it depends how everybody takes it how everybody processes these things and yeah like I said everybody's different okay yeah so we're kind of on the topic of dealing with family members in terms of um, getting help and everything Mm -hmm kind of on the same topic Mm -hmm. there are toxic family members okay we all make jokes about it like if you look at social media if you look at this Mm -hmm. kind of stuff so people go like "Ah, you know that one aunt for Mm -hmm. example yeah but that's not just the comment that's on the passing there is actually that one aunt will come for example like oh you look not very nice today oh for example you you look fat you Mm -hmm. know like they will full-on say it to you there are some people who deal with for example narcissistic people Mm -hmm. in their own families or people who are emotionally even physically abusing them Mm -hmm. different circumstances like it it ranges in severity Mm -hmm. how do you deal with toxic family members Mm -hmm. in a way that does not conflict with our religious practices or our traditions because i know for example in some western societies Mm -hmm. they can be like okay just cut them off Mm -hmm. we can't do that we have a religious duty to our family members Mm -hmm of course with limits Mm. and we have a traditional obligation like you know in our culture it's not just like cut them off how would you deal with or how would you advise people to deal with toxic family members Mm. for the most part obviously different circumstances but for the most part yeah so 
first of all, you know, it depends. Is this person your parent? Is this person you know, within the household, someone you see every single day? Or is it someone that you see once a year, you know, during aid gatherings? Okay. That's, that's one thing that basically can impact or can influence you know, how you want to approach this. So, for example, if you live with a very toxic, you know, parent who's mm-hmm. very narcissistic, very difficult, very manipulative, very judgmental, very... Um, critical constantly you know criticizing you criticizing every move you do um guilt tripping you making you feel like you're never doing enough and stuff like that that that's difficult it's like it's gonna take a mental toll on you it's gonna really damage your Mm self-esteem your self-worth it's gonna make you feel like i'm not good enough to even have my parents accept me or love me like every other kid does you know but one thing that could be very helpful in this situation is trying to, you know, set boundaries. And it's very difficult to set boundaries with families, especially, especially your parents. parents. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But, you know, you kind of need to be very firm and assertive when setting your boundaries. So, you know, for example, if you notice, you know, your parents are, you know, maybe having really difficult or um, reactive you know, conversations that might bring out reactions and these have these conversations happen in public you know you set a boundary this conversation i don't want to have it here Mm -hmm. and now because i know how this escalates and i can't have it and you have to be really you know firm with what you're saying okay and you have to stick to the boundary that you set. stick to the boundary and they're gonna come and try to break that boundary i'm your parent you can't tell me what to do if i want to talk about this now i will Mm -hmm. you know but at the end of the day, we're humans more than that. I mean, we're initially, we are humans before we are anything else. Huh? Mm-hmm. And everyone needs to respect boundaries. I mean, if I tell you I don't want to talk about this in public or I don't want to um, you know, deal with this right now, I don't have to deal with this right now. I am human too. I get you know very heavy about these things. I feel a bit attacked and I don't want this to happen in public. So okay. please, if you want to have this conversation, let's just have it at home in a quiet space in a peaceful setting Mm -hmm. you know other boundaries can include like either for example some like your family's your family barges in your room okay every 30 minutes to throw an insult or to make you feel like you know you're not doing this you're not doing that you know all that stuff you know you can tell them before you come to my room please knock and just check that you know i'm ready to have a conversation so fine this may come off as very impolite and disrespectful but it's again it's how you say it and how you address it how you communicate it there's always, you know, there needs to be a way to, uh, an approach, a very specific okay. approach to these things. But generally, setting boundaries, being firm with them, being assertive, letting them know how it makes you feel. And the thing is, it's very difficult also to get their you know, understanding on how you're feeling sometimes, especially if they're very toxic and they don't listen, they don't, they're not empathetic at all with you. Mm-hmm. And in, the, in those cases, you know, you can try to kind of detach yourself emotionally from them. Okay. You know, you try to remind yourself, yes they're my parents and yes their words affect me very much but at the end of the day they're also human they maybe don't know any better and this is how they handled this thing and i need to learn not to take it personal okay i need to learn that everybody has their flaws everyone has their certain you know ways of dealing with people and dealing with things and maybe my parents think that this is the way to deal with me Mm -hmm. which i don't agree with but i'm just gonna you know put a boundary set the boundary i'm gonna try to detach myself emotionally from this and try to not take everything personal and just see it from their point of view and know they just don't know any better okay and you s- that way you kind of you know disconnect that idea that whatever my parents say about me is a reflection is a of reflection me. of me and instead it's a reflection of them mm-hmm. and that they don't know maybe any better and that you just have to accept that for what it is you okay know? okay so it's like reprogramming your brain where like You've set a boundary. Mm -hmm. They did not follow that boundary. Mm -hmm. So now you set a boundary within yourself in Mm -hmm. terms of your reaction and your emotions towards that specific thing they're doing. Exactly. So I reprogram my mind that, okay, you can call me whatever name you want. But I know my worth. I I know know my my worth. I know that this is a reflection of you. Whatever you're saying is a reflection of you, your own issues. This Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with me. So this would be the next step if you've tried setting boundaries and that did not work. Uh, It doesn't even have to be the next step. It could be the first step. The first step. Exactly. It's... And it happens all at the same time. You know, while you're setting your boundaries, you're also also trying to emotionally, exactly. Especially if you feel like there's no way around it and there's no way they're going to get to the level of understanding that you'd like them to. You know, you kind of have to just detach because there's things we can and we can't control, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people's reactions towards you or people's behaviors or people's attitudes, there's not much you can do about it other than you trying to, you know, contain yourself and just manage yourself well 
in a way that you know you, you try not to let these things affect you and it's very important to have that sense of spirituality you know and when we say you know when people you know say oh go pray five times a day and you'll be fine okay that right. might not work so you need both that and you know um to seek help seek support seek therapy but i always and it's very nice to know that there's someone up there that is always protecting you and watching, and over, watching you. over you and always has you know your best you know, his best interests for you and always wanting the best and wanting to take care of you and it's nice to feel like you have someone to talk to and if anything it works so well with therapy because if anything it gives you that sense of any and to talk you know limited to but you know therapy you got to do things on your own you got to work and you got you, you work on what you can control and then when it comes to the spirituality the things you can't control it's like you you give it to you god like to Allah. okay so Allah. so this is i can't control it i need you to help me exactly. control this part exactly so this is where it comes really helpful you know and it's very nice yeah, and when you connect spirituality and you know islam with therapy because it and, and, and it, all together you can see there's a lot of commonalities and you notice a lot of things that help with therapy also have like, been mentioned in the religion as something that helps exactly and also there is just to point out there is a very clear um verse mm. that mentions that god will not change what's in a person until you change what's in yourself mm-hmm. So you notice you have an issue. Go get the help. Exactly. God will support you if you ask for support once you've been open to changing mm. yourself. <laughs> you know, f- f- it goes hand in hand. So the point of what we're discussing now is to just m- mention that getting psychological help, getting mm. therapy, getting whatever goes hand in hand with spirituality. Exactly. You know, exactly. I just want to make that distinction clear mm. because I believe in both. Mm. And I think we should all believe in both. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. Um, And okay. it's nice. It's also you know, when it comes to you know praying five times a day. That's as uh, any as uh, it's meditating. You know, it's being mindful. Yeah, many people don't know that prayer is actually considered a meditative. It is, um, it is. exactly because for those five ten minutes that you're praying, you are dissociating just in the present moment. Mm-hmm. Any Surah Al-Fatiha. You know, you from the beginning till the end, you are in that moment, in that present moment. You, it's just you and Allah. Okay, and you're just there to talk to him, and you're doing this with all your senses, with all your, you know, emotions, with all your feelings, just focused on that one task, mm-hmm. you know, and it just really grounds you. It's very, very grounding, and I think it helps so many people to basically get themselves into the present moment and just grounding themselves. Okay. Mm. Okay. So the spirituality part we've discussed that. Mm-hmm. Okay, how do you choose the right therapist? So there's different. You know how, for example, if you have, I'm gonna mess this up, It's okay? Because I do not know the correct names for different doctors. Like there's okay. like an orthopedist and a, okay, okay. Foot thing is a pedi pediatrician. Foot thing. Wait, oh, th- is that the kids one or the? No, foot is the ortho. I think. Is it the okay. ortho? I'm confused. Uh, now. Do you know? Pedi- pediatrician is kids. Okay, doctor. so pediatrician is a kids doctor. Mm. Oh, podiatrist is the foot one. Oh right, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so for example, you have a foot issue, you go to a podiatrist. Yes. You you have a child, you'll take them to a pediatrician. Mm-hmm. Okay, so is it the same for psychology? Mm-hmm. Now, for example, if you're going to look for a psychologist, let's say, for example, you have OCD. Okay. Okay, or someone has anxiety. Yes. Or someone has schizophrenia. You have to go to a specialist. Well, uh, what do you do? Okay, so first of all, your first question, you're picking the right therapist, mm-hmm. right? Like picking... The therapist that's gonna work with you on your difficulties, your specific difficulties. So okay. obviously that's different for anxiety, different for depression, different for schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's take it step by step. First of all, choosing the right therapist is a journey in it, on its own. Okay? okay, finding the therapist that you can connect with, that you can relate to, that can relate to you, that understands your problems, that approaches the treatment in a way that you are comfortable with mm-hmm. this is something that you know might take you one two three times to find that one therapist that you really connect with okay, okay? but things you can do to help basically get you in the right direction of picking your therapist is you can always you know ask the clinic that you're about to uh, enter about you know who's here who's working wh- what are their qualifications uh, years of experience female male mm-hmm. you know um, a lot of people 
prefer certain ages you know some people prefer certain religion i've noticed that religion certain um backgrounds you know like for example someone who's armani might prefer someone who speaks arabic you know uh, or someone from the same culture to feel like this person understands where i'm coming from Mm -hmm. but someone who has a very generic um you know or or, like someone who doesn't have very culture specific difficulties may feel like okay i don't need someone specifically or money or anyone Arab, can help me anyone can help me with okay. this it's a general thing you know but it depends on everybody's preferences but i would say to pick the right therapist you need to and you do your research a little mm-hmm. bit you know ask around ask um like i said the qualifications years of experience um what they specialized in are they a psychologist are they a psychiatrist um do they practice certain therapies do they offer specific okay. services you know because psychology is so broad and then there's like different ways to treat different disorders and then there's in within these disorders different uh, methods Categories, different techniques different, okay. you know but it all depends on how much you research and what you're looking for before going so to therapy so you should research of method. course of course okay read from people's experiences ask around um yeah research 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 and don't feel afraid to ask the clinic you know okay. who am i seeing and specify you know i prefer a male i prefer a female and for example a lot of female uh, therapists mm-hmm. sorry a lot of um female clients prefer to see female therapists mm-hmm. sometimes men like to see ma- male therapists you know or maybe even the opposite mm-hmm. I mean, everyone has a f- preference basically okay but it depends um, and is it like a, a normal hospital where for example if you're not sure what's wrong with you you go mm-hmm. to a general and then they diagnose you and maybe send you to a specialist. Like, for example, I don't know, I, I have OCD. Mm. I'd go f- general therapy. Mm. And then they'd be like, okay, you have OCD. Let's say, for example, I would recommend exposure therapy or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you go for, mm-hmm. you know, to someone who's actually specialized, specialized. in OCD method. Yes, yes. Is it is that how it works? So that that works in one way. Yes, some okay. clinics might adopt that um, th- any method of seeking therapy or seeking the right therapist Mm -hmm. but for example at al of medical clinic we offer like these 15 minute intake sessions okay Okay. and the purpose of these 15 minute intake free sessions by the way okay are to um, over the phone or in person not in person okay you can even do it online we have both options you Mm -hmm. can do it either online or in person is basically for us to see for us to let you know First of all, we ask, you know, basic details, your name, where you're from, what you do, uh, level of education, um, any past medical history in the family or like mental illnesses in the family, any history that we need to be aware of, any medication you're on. And then we get to the point where it's like, what is your main concern? Okay, okay. why are you seeking therapy today? Mm-hmm. What, what brought you here? Basically, we hear a little bit about them. You know, we see what they're struggling with. And then from there. Our job is to basically let them know. So we've got this staff here. We've got this person, this person, this person, this person is this. This person works with these kind of cases. Um, this person uh, is from this place, you know, and mm-hmm. we try to introduce them to the therapists that are specialized in dealing with these difficulties okay and then from there you know we see what they prefer we let them know you know this person is a male but he is specialized in this 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 person is a female she's you know around this age and blah 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 would you recommend the for example for your specific case i would recommend this yes basically okay. and i'll let them know you know this person has a lot of experience in these kind of cases and i think she or he might be really helpful for you but again you know you can always do your research and for example at al of medical clinic we also have a, like little you know bibliography for each um, therapist but they okay. can you know, take a read they can look what they see what they look like you mm-hmm. know um you know they have that basically that permission to to go ahead and go pick ahead and, and research and whoever they exactly. want and that's why we offer these sessions to help them pick the right therapist for them okay yeah okay and now maybe just like we'll end it in a more general yeah um a lot of people are stressed like they work mm-hmm. their jobs whether they have something going on in their life mm-hmm day-to-day stress Mm -hmm. what are some ways they can manage that Um, yeah like i you know like we touched on this earlier in the beginning self-care make sure you've got people to talk to you know don't feel like you need to go through this alone um if you're alone you know speak to allah if Mm -hmm. that's the only option you have but i think it's very important to have social a social circle just someone that can listen to you someone that can help you you know get through the day um and little things like i said you know taking care of yourself having a nice bath before bed um putting on a movie to switch off from work Mm -hmm. um just understanding that life is difficult and it is meant to be difficult and 
just because you know you're struggling doesn't make you weak but if anything you just need a few skills and just a few you know conversations to get you going to understand you know where you're struggling what's happening but it's not something that you you know nobody gets through and it's not okay. somebody that it's not something that needs to be a, a permanent you know struggle and you know day-to-day stressors happen you know we just have to learn how to take it all in and just be accepting and open and know this is life things go wrong so life is tough it's not about like removing the difficulty it's about making yourself stronger to be able to deal with the difficulty when it comes more resilient in in the face of these struggles you know being Mm -hmm. able to any approach it in a more resilient way approach it in a more um you know mentally strong uh, take a more mentally strong approach okay okay and and you're gonna have to go through this to us and become resilient or become mentally stronger to begin with so exactly. you don't as much as you can look at it as a maybe not so bad of an experience when mm. you you know put that mindset mm. exactly and okay yeah then like i said there's just many things that you can you know do to help yourself get through the day little things that make you happy uh spending time with your pets even you know um taking you know your dog i'm just on gonna walk. put a disclaimer mm-hmm. to my mom mm-hmm. she's gonna watch this mm-hmm. you see she said pets mm-hmm. help in your mental health exactly so my mom you're <laughs> resisting and my dad <laughs> there's a professional here who said that this is good for not it's only amazing. my mental health all your mental health exactly. so mama please yani mm-hmm. uh, we need a cat at home i think you guys do. Okay. i think everybody needs a can pet. you look at the camera and tell my mom that we need a cat yeah, everybody needs a pet Okay. Yeah, it helps in your mental health. It helps in your mental health. Thank you very much. That's a professional opinion, Mama. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, Saraha, like little things make big differences, you know, and you just have to be open to exploring new things, new experiences, new hobbies, new activities, getting yourself out of that, you know, day to day routine, day to day stress, and you change it up a little bit. Okay. You know, mix it up, have fun. Um, notice the little things as you're driving, you know, notice that building. Was that here last week? I don't think so. Okay. You know, did I even notice that uh, this new car in Oman? No. You know, Consciousness, like, awareness, awareness, gratitude for the small things. Exactly. You know, you see a little cat in the streets, uh, give it a little bit of water, a little bit of a snack. You know, these okay. little things make such big differences mm-hmm. and make you feel so good. Because it makes you realize how little we are in this big, big, big world, you okay, know. Okay, and that's important. Hey, well, exactly. And again, there's things we can control and things we can't control, and that's absolutely fine, mm-hmm. you know. And that's why we have Allah to take over the things that we don't have control that's, over. And the concept you mentioned, tawakkul. Exactly, and the rest is, you know, just seek help and support for it. It's nothing, you know, to be ashamed of at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sitting down with us. I think we got a lot of valuable information. Mm -hmm. Some people might be looking for a lot of what you mentioned. So I really, really do appreciate your time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that's our episode for Mm -hmm. today. Amazing. Thank you.